I'm in the middle of a nine day trip and uh, thought I'd walk you through a little bit what I'm doing for gear on this trip and and uh, show you some of the beautiful scenery that we're, we're walking through this week. This is my cook kit and for this trip I really focused on weight over function and I'll show you what I got here. Most of my meals require a little bit of cooking so, whoops. So I will cook inside my pot, uh, things like chili with beans that take a few minutes to cook and things like that. Not expecting horrible weather up here by any means, and we, we certainly haven't had any bad weather up here. It's been sunny the whole time. So I am using just a sit on top canister stove for this trip. And I chose the little fire maple stove and the reason I did that, you can read about the benefits of this little stove versus something like the BRS 3000T in our recent canister stove review and gear guide. And I'll put a link to that in the description below. But this little fire maple stove is probably the best performing small stove that we've tested. And so this is generally what I like to use when I'm absolutely trying to save space and weight. And since we're carrying nine days of food, uh, space and weight was definitely at a premium on this trip. I also ditched the fire starter, although I do have a rudimentary fire starter in my kit because we're not really building fires on, on this trip. So I just brought a mini Bic lighter and then I have the fire starter as a backup. I have the uh, Snow Peak titanium bowl and then a four dog stoves custom lid for it. Um, I took the knob off the lid and made my own with a little loop of string. And I did that mainly because that knob kind of gets in the way of packing and I wanted something that had a, a flat profile. And then for a pot handle, a pot lifter, I'm using the little carbon fiber one that weighs, you know, a tenth or two tenths of an ounce from Sulik 46. And so that gives me the ability to hold the pot while I eat and grab it for uh, taking it off the stove when it's full of hot water or food. I brought a second titanium piece of cookware with me and this is the little 475 titanium mug. This is the old backpacking light version, uh, but there are some other uh, brands on the market that make this exact mug. Again, very, very light. So the pot and the mug total weigh about 4.2 ounces and that's with the lid. It gives me a lot of, of flexibility. And then I have a foam cozy for the mug so I can uh, drink a hot drink with it. When I'm cooking trout out here, I typically poach it in the titanium bowl and then debone the trout and put the bones in the mug. And then I'll put the bones into a Mylar zip bag and I'll pack those out and then um, put the poached fish into the mug and then cook my meal in here and then add the fish back to the meal to finish cooking. So some other things I have in my uh, cook kit bag are two MSR folding utensils. I use these for two reasons. One, they're very light. Two, they're very durable. And I use the fork for dealing with trout. I use the spoon for eating most of my food. I have a wash kit which consists of a tiny bottle of camp suds and then uh, just a small piece of a Brillo pad for scrubbing my pot. Every few days when you're on a long trip, take the opportunity to uh, dry your dishes in the sun after you're done washing them and get the inside surfaces of the pots exposed to direct sunlight and that really helps keep them sterile and minimizes the growth of bacteria in the pots. The ultraviolet light is a terrific sterilizer and uh, this is a nice trick for um, staying healthy on long trips. And then I have a small Spider Co. pocket knife that I use for cleaning fish. All this goes into um, a little a DCF bag from Z-Packs, so I can put all these little items in there. And 
including the stove. And they all kind of uh, nest inside my cup pretty easily. And then I can lay my cup inside the pot put the lid inside a little bit larger, DCF stuff sack, lay the pot down inside that. And that gives me a nice compact and still highly functional uh, cook kit. I brought two bottles of gas. I'll definitely go through at least the big one, part of the, part of the uh, small one, uh, mainly because I'm cooking quite a bit of fish on this trip. I've I've only brought about 18 ounces of food per day, so I'm supplementing that with trout. I've had several meals already. I'm hoping to have several more because the, the protein and added calories are really nice. Okay, so that's my cook kit. I have two ursacs of food, uh, one small ursac and one larger one, just so I have some extra space to store pots at night if I need to. All in all, again, I brought about 18 ounces of food per day, nine days worth of food. So this is obviously the bulk of my pack weight here. I can talk a little bit about my <clears throat> mealtime routines. This is breakfast. Um, I don't eat breakfast every morning. I usually do one of three different things. Um, I either eat breakfast early if I know I have a long, difficult day and that gives me energy right away to uh, start hiking and hiking hard. Gray Jays. The other option I do is in a morning like this where it's a lazy morning, we're hanging around camp, enjoying ourselves, relaxing, and um, I'll eat a late breakfast. And it's about 10.30 right now, so uh, I had a cup of coffee already this morning. Um, sat around socializing and, and walking around and exploring and now I'm ready to eat. I'm hungry. So that's what I have now. I have about a, a four or five ounce breakfast here. This is a savory breakfast that consists of uh, one of the Patagonia Provisions uh, savory breakfast meals. And then I added some ramen noodles to it uh, just to bulk it up a little bit and give me some more uh, bulk and calories. So that's breakfast this morning. The third thing I do is fast. Now, I, I never fast on days that I know I have a lot of hard hiking to do. I try to keep my energy up as much as possible and I know that fasting just doesn't work for me on long, difficult trekking days. That said, yesterday, for example, I did a 24 hour fast from 8 p.m. the night before, which is about when I finished my dinner to 8 p.m. last night, which is when I started last night's dinner. So I fasted in between and just hydrated with water, electrolytes, and coffee throughout the day. We had about a four to five hour hike. Uh, it was all off trail over, most of it was over Talus. Um, so it wasn't like we're, we weren't doing anything. I was obviously carrying a big backpack and whatnot, uh, but yeah, everything worked out fine. And I, I try to fast like that between 16 and 24 hours um, every other day at least that's what I'm doing on this trip uh, we had a couple of harder days and so I, I ended up skipping uh, two days of fasting in order to eat throughout those days but I fasted yesterday today's an off day I never fast two days in a row so uh, it's breakfast time now and then uh, two more days left of hiking and I will probably I don't know what I'll do. We'll see how I feel in the morning, but tomorrow might be a fast day as well. I brought enough food on this trip to have three meals a day every single day. So I have plenty of food. Plus I've been catching trout and eating trout um, to supplement my, my rations. Uh, that said, I'm gonna come home with a whole bunch of food because this is the first trip where I've experimented with intermittent fasting aggressively. And I wanted to see how it worked out uh, in terms of like not only changes in body composition which i'm curious about at the end of the trip um, but also 
um, just how I feel and what I can deal with out here when I'm in a fasted state. For water treatment supplies, my main in-camp water bottle is a two liter hydro pack bottle. I like this because I can connect a bee free filter to it, which is the main water treatment system I have. I also carry the 20 ounce bee free bottle, also a hydro pack bottle. And that is in my hip belt pocket of my backpack as I hike so that I can just dip from a stream or lake and grab a quick pint of water. I also have a 16 ounce platypus bottle. I use this for mixed electrolyte drinks and that way I'm not running electrolytes in my bottles that I'm using to filter pure water. My electrolyte of choice on this trip is noon because that was what is available. Um, I'm, I like the flavor of it. I'm not a huge fan of the fact that it has dextrose in it. I, I would prefer that it was just an electrolyte drink. And then as a backup, I have an Aquamira kit and it's a very small kit and I don't use it often. I haven't even used it on this trip. I probably won't unless my filter fails. And it basically consists of an Aquamira kit that's been repackaged into smaller dropper bottles and then I have an even tinier dropper bottle that I use as the mixing bottle. So the Aquamira kit and my electrolyte bottle and then the bee free filter attached to the 20 ounce bottle and my electrolytes uh, can all be packaged into this kit with the two liter water bottle if necessary, but usually I just, I tuck this away while I'm hiking and I keep this kit handy with me in my pack. If I know I'm having to do long miles and I'll keep the 20 ounce bottle and the be free filter in my hip belt pocket so that it's accessible and I can grab water without taking my pack off. In addition, I'll throw that be free bottle with the filter into my fanny pack, which I take on day hikes or climbs or runs or whatever uh, that I'm doing away from camp so that I have just very minimal stuff with me, but I still want to have the ability to uh, have some water on my day hike. My shelter of choice for this trip is the Locust Gear Jedi Dome. I am really, really happy I brought this tent on this trip. Um, it's overkill for summer in the Sierra where you just don't get a lot of weather. Um, it's a terrific tent if it's windy or rainy and you want to have livable protection from the elements and you're spending a lot of time in your tent. It does have a vestibule with it. I brought it with me, but I haven't even set it up yet. We haven't had a drop of rain. But the real reason I'm loving this tent and this environment, because there is so much interior space in this tent, it just makes it a really livable shelter. Now, that's great for storms, but what has made it a very pleasant tent on this trip is the mosquitoes. They have been horrendous this week, and the ability to crawl in the tent and zip the door up and hang out with a great view has been wonderful. Um, I like it better for this kind of environment than your typical cramped bivy sacks or tarp tents or anything like that because there is so much room and you still have this massive open door for a view. The other thing I've been doing in the tent, especially when we have been living below the tree line, is cooking in it when there's horrendous bugs out. And so I can just keep the mesh door open for ventilation and make my morning coffee or eat breakfast in the tent, which has been great. Uh, I'll give the usual disclaimer about cooking in a tent. It's risky and you need to understand those risks. Make sure to listen to the podcast that I have on cooking in a tent and ways to effectively do that. A link to that podcast is available in the video description below. Some of the features of the Locust Gear Jedi, it has uh, two crossing poles, so it is known as a wedge style tent. Uh, lots of exterior guy lines that allow it to be stabilized in windy environments. And one of my favorite features is that it is truly a freestanding tent. So if you're in an environment like this, above the tree line, very rocky ground, uh, not being able to put stakes into the ground is not a huge deal for this tent and so it gives you a lot of flexibility to camp in alpine environments like this and have views like that it's a pretty pretty nice little tent 
So for this trip, I went with comfort for my mattress. I have a Nemo Tensor wide regular mattress. It's one of the few mattresses. It's made in a wide width, but just a regular length. I'm not very tall, but I appreciate the wide width because then when I sleep on my back, my arms stay on the mattress and it's much more comfortable. Probably one of the most comfortable uh, inflatable mattresses I've ever slept on. It's a little bit heavy. So uh, anyway, link to that in the, in the notes below. I have two cords pre-rigged onto the mattress pad and those cords are for attaching my quilt, which is a Katabatic Gear Chisos, which is a 40 degree quilt. And I have to admit that I've had a little bit of chill on a couple of nights, especially up here last night. It was quite cold last night. But I put all my clothes on in the middle of the night, which included rain gear and everything, and stayed warm and slept well the rest of the night. So, so 14 ounces for the quilt, but when it gets chilly and down or below freezing, you definitely have to layer the rest of your clothes on. I do carry a pillow this trip. I have the Hyperlite Mountain Gear Stuff Sack pillow and I use a couple of layers of open cell foam in that pillow because it gives me the right amount of comfort and um, support for my head when I sleep on my side. And if I want, I can add more clothing and, and extra gear to the bottom side of that pillow to raise the height if I need to. I've tried lots of different pillow combinations. Uh, we have a whole gear guide about pillow reviews. We have a pillow review on this and um, I'm gravitating towards this more and more. I appreciate the, I appreciate the support that open cell foam provides. I had to play with this foam and, and tried to several different types in order to get the right balance between soft and firm that I like and that's comfortable for me. And I finally have a pillow that I feel is really dialed in. Uh, this is worth the extra weight to me and it really helps my sleep at night. So I'm going to pack up and we're going to spend the day on a whole bunch of talus. So uh, let's get going. Okay, let's go through my routine for packing up and getting out of camp. Um, I'm using a uh, McHale fairly large uh, windsock on this trip. It's a Dyneema composite fabric hybridized to a 100% Dyneema outer fabric for durability. This is my expedition pack when I know I have to carry some weight. We're out for nine days, so I have quite a bit of food and some camera gear and some fishing gear and things like that. So I appreciate the comfort of, of something like this. I have it rigged with a, an accessory pouch on the back side here. And that's where I'll start right now. And in that pouch is going to go my maps. I have satellite maps, I have some detailed topographic maps, and I have an overview map of our whole area. Also in here is a compass, my hiking permit, my fishing license, and a couple of sharpie pins that I can use to mark uh, notes and things like that on the maps. The other thing that goes in here is my toilet paper kit. I've got well, I shouldn't call it a toilet paper kit. I'll call it a toilet kit. So let's take a look at what's in here. I have some uh, shop towels cut up into squares that I use for cleaning up. I have hand sanitizer and soap for washing. A small titanium trowel. And then a, another Ziploc bag that I use to pack my toilet paper out in. Um, I don't bury my toilet paper out here. It's too sensitive of an environment. I won't pull it out and show you the, uh, the goodies. Um, so that's my toilet paper kit. It always stays on the outside of my pack because it seems that I have to go after I start walking. Um, I tend to use a bidet method. And so I tend to be a washer, not a wiper. And so when I have to go number two, I will fill my two liter bottle of water up with me, take this kit with me, find a nice remote spot away from water and trails and do my business out there. The other thing that goes in this pocket is my fishing kit. And basically I just have a box of flies, a couple of spare Tenkara liters and some tippet material. And of course my Tenkara rod, which is rigged and ready to go with the fly on it so that I can fish as I hike, okay? 
So that's that outside pocket. The first thing I'm gonna pack in the bottom of my pack is my sleeping bag bag. Um, in here include, let's see, in this bag is my sleeping bag, my running clothes that I use for day hiking and, and running, which is a pair of Patagonia Strider Pro shorts and a Prana synthetic sleeveless shirt. Extra socks, long underwear bottoms, that goes in the bottom of my pack. I never have to access this during the day. Next is my pillow stuff sack, which includes my pillow as well as my folded up sleeping pad and my sleeping pad inflation bag. My synthetic insulated parka, which has its own stuff sack. I'm gonna shove that down into the side of the pack just to fill some of the void space in there because the pack has a fairly sizable cross-sectional area and the gear I have in there is not very big. Next comes food. I use Hyperlite Mountain Gear pods for food storage. Um, before I hit the trail, I'm going to pull out a lunch and I'm going to look for a coffee. Um, I use five mil Mylar zip storage bags for food storage. These are totally odor proof and very durable. Unlike some of the ultralight bags and the more popular well-known bags on the market that are neither odor proof nor durable. So I use these, it does cost some extra weight and some extra waste. Uh, but when you're in an area like this and you, you're storing your food in ursacs, um, it's kind of nice to have that extra security. Okay, so let's look for coffee because I will undoubtedly want a cup of coffee on the trail today. And I have that labeled in one of my breakfast bags. So I will pull out a cup of coffee there and put it more accessible. The reason I like the pods for food storage is that they are the shape of my pack and uh, for stuff like this that's this dense if you try to store it in a cylindrical container like an ursac and then put it in your pack it creates a lot of void spaces so this solves that problem keeps my stuff organized and then at the end of the day when I'm ready to put the food in I'll just slide these into my ursacs. Next, I'll put the ursacs into the pack. There's still some room on the sides of the pack, and so these are used just to fill void space. Okay, next I have another pod that I use for some of these essentials. In this bag, I've got my first aid and repair kit, as well as my EpiPen. I have a satellite phone, we're with a group, and so we always take a satellite phone with us for safety. I have my flashlight, I also have a photon light that I keep more handy in another kit. Toiletries that I will not be using on the trail and my eyeglasses in case my contacts don't work or I get an eye infection or something like that. So this goes into a zipper bag, sits sideways into a pod. I have an electronics bag, which includes extra batteries and camera equipment. And, and the remaining gear I have is my cook kit and my gas. My cook kit I'm gonna keep out handy for afternoon coffee on the trail and I'll put the large can of gas in this pod and that pod then will go inside the pack.
Okay, so now I've got stuff that I'm not gonna access at all during the day. Now I've got a little bit of room obviously left. We're halfway through a nine day trip. So um, I've got two side pockets, a top pocket, um, and two hip belt pockets, and then some space available up in the top of the pack. So the only thing I really wanna put in the top of the pack now, I think, are my cook kit and my storm clothes, which includes this bag, which contains my wind shirt, rain jacket, and a warm hat. I don't have warm gloves on this trip. Didn't think I needed them, although I would have appreciated them last night when I took a run up there at sunset and my hands were very cold. So there's a little bit of a nook that was created by that last bag I put in. And my stove kit and gas can fit right there. And then my storm clothes can go right on top of that. And then the last thing I'll put in my pack is my chair. I won't use that on the trail. I use an REI Flexlite Air chair. It's the lightest and most comfortable full chair on the market. If you haven't yet done so, check out my review of the REI Flexlite Air versus the Helinox. I'll put that link below, as well as our recent uh, camp chair, lightweight camp chair gear guide, which goes through a whole bunch of different chair options, including real chairs like this that actually have four legs and a seat. Okay, that's everything inside my pack. Now I can roll it up. And the only thing I'm going to access inside the actual backpack throughout the day is my cook kit. If the weather gets bad, of course, the storm clothes are right there if I need them. Okay, what's next? Oh, you know what I forgot to put in my pack? My tent. I had it behind me, away from the rest of my gear. So I'm gonna take out my storm clothes and my chair, my cook kit and my gas, and that last pod filled with all those other essentials, and put my tent in because the tent I won't need any access to. I put my poles inside the pack and they can shove down along the corner, just fine. Keeps them nice and protected. I'll put that essentials bag back in. Put my stove kit in that little void space along with my gas. Storm clothes and chair. I'll actually put the chair in first the storm clothes on top of that. Now I'm about ready to go. I'll show you what's left. First I have a fanny pack, which I use on my uh, day runs and hikes. Inside the fanny pack is my inReach, a waterproof Ziploc for my phone if needed, and then a whistle and a photon light. Otherwise I don't really bring much on my day hikes. I have a small bag of balms that includes sunscreen, insect repellent, lip balm, and body glide for my feet. So those, those I access all the time throughout the day. And those will actually go into my hip belt pocket, but I will run or hike in these when I go on an excursion away from camp. My lunch goes into one of my hip belt pockets. While on the trail, I will put a bee free bottle and filter into one of my hip belt pockets. And then the rest of my water supplies will go into the top pocket. If I have to carry two liters of water, which I have not yet had to do on this trip, I will put that in the back pocket most likely. And then today we're going to be traveling on Talos, so the trekking poles are going to get stowed. Okay, so let's talk about my footwear on this trip. I'm wearing the Scarpa Zen Pro. 
they are a full leather approach shoe with a full toe rand, a climbing edge along the sole, and a Vibram lug sole. Um, very sturdy, stiff shoe, and it's my preferred um, footwear for travel where I have to do a lot of talus or third and fourth class scrambling. So that's that's part of the reason why I'm wearing this shoe. The other reason is that I am recovering from a metatarsal injury in my left foot. I injured uh, the second, third, and fourth metatarsals and created stress fractures and then the spring um, trail running and cross-country skiing and so it just got over fatigued and so I'm recovering those a bit. Inside my Scarpa I do have an orthotic. It's a high volume footbed uh, primarily for I, I like to size my shoe up for a wider toe box. It requires me to fill up some of that volume with a footbed. The sole orthotic is cork and foam, so it's very pliable. I prefer not to use a stiff footbed, and it's heat moldable to my feet. I wear darn tough trekking socks. I imagine these socks will be fine for the whole trip. One pair, I've been washing them out um, every day and letting them dry, and then I have a spare pair of socks that I wear in camp and to bed. Before I hit the trail, Especially on a day like today where we have lots of talus, I'm going to use Body Glide on my feet as a lubricant. And that has a huge impact on managing blisters and maceration. These shoes don't drain very well. And so when I cross a, a river or a marshy area and my feet get wet, they stay wet. And the Body Glide really helps prevent my feet from getting overhydrated and wrinkled and uh, keeps them healthy on a long trek like this. If you want to learn more about maceration and other immersion foot diseases, be sure to check out our recent podcast about it. And I'll link to that podcast in the show notes. So I'm going to apply the body glide to my heel the ball of my foot and all around every toe and between the toes. Those are the most sensitive areas that are going to be prone to blisters. My only complaint about this body glide is that I've used it up on this trip. I'm only on day six and I have three more to go. And I think next time I'll bring the bigger tube. As I get prepared for the day, we are going to hit Talus right away because we are well off trail. And I am going to lace my scarpas up pretty tight so that my foot does not shift inside the shoe. This is another reason why I prefer these over trail runners. It just gives me much more security in navigating complex rocky terrain than a trail running shoe does. Now I've done plenty of towel scrambling on trail running shoes as well, uh, but you just don't have the ability to lock in the entire length of the shoe uh, for stability on difficult terrain with a trail running shoe. And one reason I really like a shoe like this for um, class two to class four routes in the mountains. Okay, and that's my foot care and footwear system for a predominantly off-trail trip that involves lots of talus, scree, and some scrambling. I shoulder my backpack, walk away from the car, step on the dirt path on a journey not too far. It's the same in all seasons, I can only pray to walk as much of the trails till my dying day. Look for me in the mountains where walking has a way of pulling you to your peace of mind. Trade all my ambition, all the money I can make To 
walk up on the high road, camp down by the lake. You can't buy this kind of beauty, it's a gift every day. The bright out and glow mornings take my breath away. Look for me. We are in the Talus, which is my favorite place to be in the mountains.